Now, in designing a case study, we come to the, um, the basic question, is it a methodology or a method? And a case study is one of the very few that is both. Um, it provides an overall methodology, a way of thinking about doing our research, um, where we can actually incorporate a range of different methods within the case study framework. We're exploring various cases and we could use a whole range of data collection methods um, and processes to achieve that. But it can also be framed as a method within other methodologies um, as part of a um, say an ethnographic study uh, where that's your overall methodology you're trying to immerse yourself in an understanding of the culture that's occurring as part of that you may do some case studies looking at individual specific elements within an overall ethnographic study or as part of a phenomenological study, where you're trying to explore the different phenomenon that are occurring in a situation. As part of that, you may do some case studies as part of your methods within your overall methodology of phenomenology. But case studies are somewhat unique in the fact that within the overall methodology of case study research, you could also use case studies um, as a method of collecting data. But you could also do, say, a quasi-experimental study to also collect some data, maybe on student test performance or something like that, where you're getting some quantitative data. Still part of an overall methodology of case study, but using other methods um, in addition to case study methods. Okay, so that's back to the old distinction between methodology and methods. So one of the big advantages of case studies are they're not strongly positioned within any particular philosophical framework. Um, if you have a strong positivist, realist perspective where you're trying to uncover the truth that's out there, then case studies can be used to do that. Now, they're a little bit challenged because they're very clearly qualitative, whereas um, those philosophical perspectives tend to favour the quantitative approaches. But nevertheless, within a strong positivist uh, philosophical framework, case studies can be used as an effective methodology and method. But likewise, if you are coming from a relativist perspective, where you believe that things are very much free-flowing and we construct knowledge and it's being constructed all the time, then case studies are equally relevant to that uh, philosophical approach to research. So case studies can be used across the spectrum, which makes it very versatile. Now, there are some um, reasons why case studies are very popular. The first is that it's, um, it does tend to reduce the reliance upon the positivist um, and post-positivist perspectives um, favoring quantitative studies. Um, case study research can, because it gathers such rich data and can do so from a whole range of different approaches, has been shown to develop concepts and ideas that haven't been achievable through rigorous quantitative approaches, where the flexibility of case studies to immerse within the data and gather data from a whole range of different sources can often uncover unexpected and quite insightful understandings that aren't achieved in other approaches. Now, it also accepts though that we can have a whole range of different understandings of um, epistemology and um, phenomenology and that different truth isn't necessarily fixed and case studies are equally comfortable in gathering um, an understanding of what's occurring in their cases where things are dynamic and changing versus trying to uncover a fixed understanding of a positivist perspective. 
one aspect of case studies though it is very strongly based on the participants perspective yes the researcher can become quite immersed in the data and in the case that's being explored but essentially we're exploring it from the participants experiences and their perspectives of what's happening they are the general source of data not so much the researcher it's not like grounded theory or um, phenomenology um, or ethnographic studies where the researcher is really part of the experience case studies still keep a a distinction between the researcher and the case being explored and the way we gather the data and the rich data is through artifacts and I'll discuss those but it's through the participants experiences um, but with that it does make it quite up to date and able to look at what's happening immediately so it's not reliant upon looking at what's happened in the past we can do case studies around things that are happening now and that's quite a flexible thing um, in terms of research and finally the greatest strength is that it creates very rich descriptions and these are particularly useful in generating research results that are um, useful for the popular consumption uh, the popular media popular press for everyday understanding about what's occurring so it's not bounded up into a whole range of research um, techniques that are relatively undecipherable unless you've studied research methodologies. Um, the rich descriptions that are available provide nice, easily describable vignettes of what's occurring. And we can use those to support the arguments that are being made about the findings from the case study. And case studies rely a lot upon quotations and um, snippets and experience snippets of experiences to support the assertions being made now in the notes I provided you with a little bit of a timeline showing the evolution of research methodologies and we can see case studies sort of came into their own in the mid 1900s and have become quite well utilized now they certainly are heavily criticized um, and they're considered sort of one of the basic, um, simple research methodologies, but they're particularly useful in education. And one of the key aspects is around sample sizes. In education, we often don't have the funding to conduct very um, expensive, complicated pre-post trials, as we see with medicine and so forth, um, or really long-term in-depth explorations around ethnography and um, and phenomenology and so forth. Case studies though provide the opportunity to go in and look at particular instances and explore those in rich depth and because education is often a very complex um, nuanced uh, experience that can be different in different schools and different organizations and so forth then we have an advantage with case studies in being able to look at things in the small so look at what's happening with an individual student or a group of students or what's happening with a particular class or a school um, and that's well within the scope of educational research so that's why case studies tend to be favored in um, educational research uh, more of a pragmatic um, approach so there are a range of different aspects around case studies they are very heavily reliant upon the interpretations made by the researcher now that's understood and it needs to be open about that and we need to try to mitigate that by explaining our interpretations of what we're seeing and the biases that may be influencing us but also we can use techniques such as journaling and um, keeping detailed notes and things like that and providing that as part of the research findings uh, because the researcher while not as immersed as some other techniques the decisions being made are very heavily influenced by the researchers interpretations of the data 
Now, as long as that is made clear and the explanation is made detailed, then that is fine. It's where um, researchers make uh, conclusions and interpretations without supporting it with an explanation of how they have done so. That's where things can become problematic. Okay, so the fundamental aspects of a case study is that you're looking at a case um, and that's quite complex. It seems very simple to say, but almost anything can be a case. Uh, so you have to be very clear about what is the case that you're actually exploring. Is it an individual student? Is it a class? Is it a school? Is it an um, educational technology? There's a whole range of different uh, ways of defining what a case is. Now, part of that definition is bounding the case. So what is it not being included in that case? Are we looking at a single school? So we're not looking at other schools or other things that are going to relate. It's just that school. Um, are we bounding it by time? So we're going to look at what's happening over the last three months. Um, we could bound it by activity. So we're looking at what's happening um, with student um, test taking in that school during that three month period. So setting out the boundaries help us focus in around what the case is that we're really exploring. Okay, so then we study that case in context. So this is where we gather as much data about that case as we can. And we try to get as close to the case as possible. Now that might involve interviews and surveys and things like that, but it more often involves observations, video recordings, tape recordings, um, and trying to actually gather as much rich data about the case as we can possibly achieve. Of course, we're going to use all of that to make our interpretations. So once we have all of this contextualized data, we then need to study it in depth. So this is where we break it into categories and we try to look for patterns um, and influences. And this then generates the insights that we can report upon in terms of our understanding of what is happening and why it might be happening. So one of the approaches, as I mentioned, is we try to triangulate our data. So if we get lots of data all showing the same thing, then that strengthens the, our interpretations or the validity of our interpretations. Um, but also just having a rich array of data allows us to bring forward and support our interpretation with snippets and examples and quotes and um, documentary evidence and whatever else we can gather. Okay, so there's a range of different designs of case studies. Again, there's a whole range of different categories of case studies. Because they are so flexible and they're used in so many different ways, um, it's difficult categorizing them into a particular set of descriptions of what types of case studies there are. But there are a few different sets of categories. First is descriptive, exploratory, explanatory, illustrative, and evaluative. Um, essentially, what we're looking for and in the case study. Then we have single and multiple case studies. Are we looking at a single instance or we're we doing comparative between a range of cases? Is it an embedded or holistic um, case study exploration? Are we embedding and trying to understand it from uh, very much our own perspective within the case study? Or are we taking a much more holistic view, looking at a whole range of different influencing factors on the case study? Is it uh, particularistic, heuristic, or descriptive? And again, we'll discuss some of those terms in the tutorial. But if you want to research what those mean, you can bring those ideas to the tutorial. And is it intrinsic, instrumental, or collective? Again, some other nuances around different um, categorizations of case studies. But from all of this, we have our theoretical perspectives. Remember, we looked at our ontology and our epistemology, and our theoretical perspectives are informed by our ontology and our epistemology, and they present our understanding of um, the research process. Now, within this, there are three sort of elements of case studies. 
First is individual theories. Are we looking at what's happening with individuals within the cases? Now, they may be individual students, individual teachers, individual schools, individual countries. But are we trying to look at it from that sort of approach? Or are we trying to look at it from an organisational approach in terms of the various organisational structures that may be in place in a school or country or classroom and trying to look at how things are being organised and what's occurring in that respect. Or we can look at it from a social perspective in terms of the different power plays that are occurring, uh, the different cultural groupings, um, the group behaviours that are being expressed and all of those sort of elements of the interactions between various um, aspects of the case that we're exploring. So again, that's another way of defining what we're um, conducting our case study around. But there are three main predominant approaches. Um, exp explanatory case studies, where we're trying to explain why things are happening. Descriptive case studies, where we're just trying to describe what is occurring without necessarily going in and explaining it. And then exploratory case studies, where we're generally trying to set ourselves up for further research, where we're using the rich data collection capacity of case studies to really understand what's happening, where we then might make a decision to do an ethnographic study or um, a pre-post quantitative study based upon our initial understanding from an exploratory case study. And then the fourth one is um, called cumulative case studies, where we look at a whole series of case studies over time or over various other groupings. We might be looking at a whole range of different schools. We might look at what happens um, each year with test taking within a school or with celebratory behaviour or celebratory events at the end of each school year and look at what, how that differs over time or maybe differs by location or by socioeconomic grouping. Um, to look at a whole range of different factors. Uh, so these are some aspects of case study design you need to think about in developing your case study. What is the question you're going to try to answer as a result of your case study? What data is relevant to that? And how are you going to collect that data? And then how will you analyze that data? So they're the four essential questions that need to be sort of considered in designing a case study. And we'll discuss those in the tutorial.